This, the last two talks this afternoon are again uh, looking into tools and implementation, making the, the Magnuson Act, Act operational. Uh, the third speaker in the series uh, of, of session two is Steve Cadron from the um, uh, University of Massachusetts. Uh, Steve has a uh, almost as convoluted a career as, as Penny does. He's, he's, he's done it all. Um, right now, he's an associate professor of uh, fisheries oceanography. Uh, but before that, he's uh, taken a few twists and turns in particular. Uh, for uh, 20 years, he worked at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. So uh, when you're looking at those graphs of uh, stock trajectories, I suspect Steve can uh, see the emotional attachment against many of those arrows. Um, uh, he's going to be talking about uh, mixed, uh, mixed, uh, optimum yield and mixed stock fisheries. So Steve, over to you. Thanks, Andre. And to the other organizers, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, particularly the people behind the scenes, uh, Dave McGowan and other people who have made this work. Uh, this morning I, I was quite interested to hear the perspectives from people who were intimately involved in the policy development of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And uh, from my perspective, uh, I've been, through most of my career, involved in responding to policy changes to advance the scientific basis to meet those policy requirements. Uh, three examples that map into some of the episodes that we discussed this morning. Uh, when the National Research Council reviewed the New England groundfish assessments, I was the lead assessment scientist for yellowtail flounder, which is one of the three <coughs> principal groundfish species in New England. After the 1996 reauthorization that required uh, objective and measurable status determination criteria, uh, I analyzed most of the 55 stocks in the Northeast to develop the maximum sustainable yield reference points for those. And most recently, in the 2007 reauthorization uh, that required annual uh, catch limits, I, I was uh, voted as the chairman of the New England Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee uh, and served in that role through the deadlines of 2010-11 to meet the annual catch limit requirements. So I guess, as Andre said, as much as anybody, I am to blame for all the problems that we've heard about in New England. Uh, fortunately, much of the information that I'll be presenting uh, results from collaboration with graduate students and other scientists at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology, as, whether, as, as well as other scientists in the region. As we heard many times today, the situation in New England is very different than in the situation in the Northwest US or the Alaska region. Um, and so our perspectives are quite different. We have different points of view. Initially, I thought I was invited to this symposium to offer a different point of view. But now I'm a bit concerned after hearing all the New England bashing that this is a bit of an ambush. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, after sharing my perspectives, you'll find that although New Englanders aren't quite as polite as people in Seattle, uh, we're not entirely evil. Um, it really is a, a situation of contrast. Uh, in this region, I was at a, uh, a meeting last month with Andre where he said that Seattle is the global epicenter of fisheries research. And, and really, that's hard to argue with because <laughs> As I've said to many people, UW is probably the number one fisheries program in the world. Um, we have two. <laughs> we have two fishery science centers of NIMFS here, um, the International Pacific Halibut Commission, uh, other organizations, and, and also a very productive commercial fishing industry. And Dutch Harbor is superlative, uh, being the number one port in terms of landings. Um, we also have a superlative port. The school that I work at is uh, in New Bedford, which is the number one US fishing port in, in, economically. And so uh, although we have an economic record, we also have the dubious distinction of having the highest frequency of stocks that are subject to overfishing. So as Rick and Anna had uh, detailed, that is when the harvest rate is greater than the rate associated with maximum sustainable yield. And so if we look at our region, we have the longest list, and you really have a perfect record in this region for um, 
ending overfishing. The other dimension of stock status is the magnitude of the stock itself. Uh, and again, New England leads the way with 12 overfished stocks. So those are stocks that are lower than the minimum stock size threshold, such that they cannot produce maximum sustainable yield. Um, we've already touched on many of the reasons that have led to this situation. Um, first of all, when Magnuson was just being drafted in 1976, there had already been centuries of fishing here, where many of the fisheries in this region were still developing when Magnuson uh, was being implemented. And so we have a long exploitation history. Um, one of the topics I'll be talking about today is the challenge of mixed stock fisheries. And this is, uh, becomes an intense challenge when it comes to ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks. Um, I'll also talk about scientific uncertainty, uh, some of what Rick had touched on. So when we look at the few stocks here that are overfished in Pacific, I think we will need to confront those mixed stock fishery challenges, both in New England and in the Pacific. I'd like to take a, a very large step back to our objectives. Now, the objectives of the US management strategy and many international management strategies is sustainable fisheries in some form of optimum yield usually derived from maximum sustainable yield or maximum economic yield. And in order to achieve those higher level objectives, we need to do all of these things, like avoid overfishing, like rebuild stocks. Um, so those are really what we usually focus on. Those are the two report card maps that I just showed. Um, beyond that, there's other aspects of productivity, size structure, spatial structure, ecosystem structure, and function that need to be conserved. And then there's this one minor requirement as well, that if we want to sustain fisheries, we need uh, fishing communities and infrastructure. In Rick's analogy to uh, maximizing the lawn clippings, uh, we need to maintain the lawnmower in, in order to meet that objective as well. So we tend to get really focused and sometimes wrapped around the axle with these secondary requirements while losing focus on what our major requirement is, which is sustainable fisheries and productive fisheries. So I'll pick up with the most recent reauthorization of the Act, which as we, as we know now, required annual catch limits so that overfishing doesn't occur with some form of accountability. Um, Rick had shown this scale of catch. So this is the catch that could be regulated next year. Once we have a stock assessment, we think we know what the stock size is, we know what the harvest rate is associated with maximum sustainable yield, we can have an overfishing limit that really maps in very well to what's mandated in Magnuson. However, we cannot estimate that without uncertainty, so we have an acceptable biological catch, and the buffer between them is meant to represent the amount of scientific uncertainty we have in that overfishing limit. Now, there may be some catch that's in state waters or Canadian waters that's outside the council's control, so our annual catch limit may be somewhat less than the acceptable biological catch. And in some fishery management plans, we even have an annual catch target that's less than the annual catch limit to account for implementation error. So we have these several layers of precaution to account for scientific and management uncertainty to avoid overfishing. And this will all work, um, and also I should add that if we exceed the annual catch limit, there are accountability measures. These could be paybacks in the next year. These could be large closed areas. Uh, in some way, it's making the fishery accountable for exceeding the annual catch limit. <coughs> so this rather strict system will work. Um, in the fisheries management literature, these are termed output controls. So you're not managing how much fishermen can fish or how much, uh, what kind of gear they use or where and when they fish. You're really managing their output. You're managing the amount of catch they take out in a, in a given year. And these will work. They will be successful for ending overfishing and eventually rebuilding stocks with some conditions. That the catch can be ac accurately monitored. That the catch can be accurately reported in season to avoid exceeding the catch limit. Beyond that, some of the human dimensions expectations is that these accountability measures 
can be incentives for avoiding overfishing if those same two requirements are met, accurate catch monitoring, timely reporting of catch, and individuals are accountable. So let's go into each of those requirements. Estimating catch sounds pretty easy. And for some components of our fishery removal, they are relatively easy. Fortunately for the majority of the US catch, it's commercial landings. There's some kind of a sales slip. We can monitor the amount of fish sold, and so we can fairly accurately and precisely monitor the US catch that is sold from landings. And so if we look in this region where we have a large portion of the uh, commercial fisheries, we monitor that landings well. Commercial discards can also be monitored well. In this region, we have close to 100% at sea monitoring. Um, other fisheries, we don't have that much monitoring. Uh, in New England, we have between 20 and 30% coverage in most of our fisheries. Uh, and so we have a good estimate of discards, but not quite as good as the 100% coverage that we have in some of the Northwest and Alaska fisheries. As we move into other catch components, recreational catch is really only moderately well sampled. Uh, we have some recreational fisheries that are monitored through sampling programs. Some fisheries, uh, we have the catch estimated better than others, but really it's moderate at best. And then moving into some of our fisheries in the Western Pacific, Caribbean, Gulf, South Atlantic, um, these are small scale tropical fisheries and catch is essentially unknown. So we have roughly a north-south gradient here. It's not really the way I designed it, but the way it emerged is that um, for most of our productive um, temperate fisheries, we are monitoring most of the catch. For a lot of our subtropical and tropical fisheries, we really don't know what the catch is. So drilling down a little bit deeper into the scientific requirements of annual catch limits, we need this fishery monitoring data with accuracy, precision, timeliness, so that's in-season reporting, and transparency. We also need stock assessments that are frequent enough to monitor where the stock is, how it's responding, what the annual catch limit should be, and reliable estimates of uncertainty in the catch forecast, so we know what those buffers should be for acceptable biological catch. When we don't meet these requirements, then the actual annual catch system often fails to meet the management objectives of ending overfishing um, or achieving the optimum yield. For in-season monitoring, as I said, uh, commercial landings are relatively easy to monitor, but really what we need is all catch components to be monitored in season and reported back to the fishery so that they can responsibly fish to avoid exceeding the annual catch limits. So landings, in this case of bluefish, we can get weekly landings reports and see uh, how much of our quota has been caught up in this given week. Discards are a bit more problematic. For some of our northeast fisheries, we don't have observer data available until three months after the trip. For marine recreational data, uh, the annual surveys, the phone surveys, are not completing until after the year. So some components of catch really don't support this in-season uh, business monitoring or business decisions to avoid annual catch limits. Moving on to the other aspect of scientific support are the stock assessments. Um, we do have a great deal of uncertainty, um, and uh, Rick was calling scientific uncertainty the amount that the assessment uh, reflects the actual stock size. So here's an example with George's Bank Cod. The red line is the spawning stock biomass over time. You can see when this stock assessment was done in 2008, the estimate of 2007 stock size was relatively low, but there was some modest rebuilding happening at the end of the series. So from that, we can form rebuilding plans similar to what Anna had just uh, presented. We, have, we iterate the fishing that would allow for this rebuilding to continue. We advise an annual catch limit that supports that rebuilding. So here we have the advised catch and the actual catch. So this was before the annual catch limit requirement, but you can see that the New England Council was more or less effective in limiting the fishery to what the advised catch was. And as a sidebar, 
for the last 10 years, the New England Council has been largely, with few minor exceptions, me, uh, meeting the scientific advice with its annual catch limits. And the fishery has stayed within those catch limits. So the previous reputation for intentional overfishing is really quite outdated. So that the New England Fishery Management Council has been doing what the science has required, initially by court order, but after that as well, because they are <laughs> buying into the science now, and the fishery has been effectively uh, held to those limits. So again, I think it's a, to, not to sound defensive, but um, it, it is a bit of a bum rap now to be blaming continued overfishing on the New England Council, or even more so on New England fishermen. The problem with this is that the scientific uncertainty comes in. When this stock assessment was updated in 2010, we see that this modest rebuilding that we thought we had happening at the end of the 2000s really, in retrospect, was not occurring. In retrospect, the stock is not as high as we thought. And in retrospect, these catches were too high to avoid overfishing. So this is one of those case studies of the arrows going in the wrong direction during a rebuilding plan that Anna showed, is that the fishing mortality was actually increasing during this period of rebuilding, not because the council didn't follow the science, not because the fishermen didn't fish within the catch limits, because the science in retrospect was wrong. And so I think we, in diagnosing the problems that are happening here, we need to identify the problems accurately and uh, assign uh, accountability in the right places. Now this isn't just one case study. Uh, retrospective patterns are unfortunately a very common problem in New England. So among these flatfish stocks, you can see retrospective patterns that are at as bad as that Eastern Georgia's Bank cod or worse. And with these retrospective patterns, uh, even with the best of intentions, we cannot end overfishing or rebuild stocks because of scientific uncertainty. Now, it was interesting to see Rick Mathot uh, categorize scientific uncertainty in what he called ecosystem uncertainty. When we see this prevailing problem throughout multiple species over a decade, perhaps we are getting into a basic misunderstanding of the ecology, population dynamics, and ecosystem dynamics that are going on here that are causing this scientific uncertainty and failure to end overfishing or rebuild stocks. There is nothing new except the history that you haven't read, as we learned this morning. Um, in studying Pacific salmon stocks, Ricker was very quick to point out that really the way to achieve maximum sustainable yield is to target individual stocks. And when we target a mixture of stocks and we're trying to get their maximum sustainable yields, we're bound to drive one stock down and drive another stock up. And that Difference is only exacerbated when there are environmental influences, which of course there are. So I'll go through some examples beyond Pacific salmon, closer to home for me, for New England groundfish. <coughs> this is a yield curve that was estimated for yellowtail flounder, where the long-term expected yield increases as a function of fishing mortality. There is a fishing mortality that gives us our maximum long-term yield. That's our FMSY. When we overfish, we get less than the expected long-term yield. The one sleight of hand I'm going to make here is that I'm going to equate fishing mortality as the product of fishing effort, how much time on the water fishing boats are, are spending. So this is in units of days fishing, and this catchability coefficient. This is most simply the effect of one unit of fishing effort on the stock in terms of fishing mortality. So now I have the same yield curve of long-term expected yield as a function of fishing effort, and I have an optimal fishing effort that gives the maximum long-term yield. The reason for the sleight of hand is I can now overlay the yield curves from several different species in the same fishery. So there are, there's fishing effort that is influencing mortality on yellowtail flounder, cod, and haddock. And just because of their basic vital rates, growth, natural mortality, reproduction, the optimal effort for haddock 
is much greater than for cod or yellowtail flounder, and the productivity of yellowtail flounder is much less than cod or haddock. Again, this is just because of the selectivity, growth, mortality, and reproduction. And as Ricker showed, it's difficult to determine what level of fishing effort you should use to optimize the yield for all three of these species because they have different vital rates. They also have very different stock conditions. Uh, we have haddock, which is doing quite well. It's above the biomass that produces maximum sustainable yield. Yellowtail flounder and cod are at much lower levels. They're less than their minimum stock size threshold. Yellowtail flounder is, in one sense, in an effective rebuilding plan that we've effectively reduced the fishing mortality such that overfishing is not occurring anymore, but it has not rebuilt yet. That may take time. For cod, as I showed with the retrospective pattern, we're still overfishing, largely because of that retrospective pattern, and the stock is still overfished. So in addition to them having different optimal fishing efforts, they also have different stock conditions, where two of them were trying to rebuild, and one of them were trying to exploit at its optimum level. So this really produces what we call choke stocks, stocks that are limiting the overall attainment of optimum yield. Uh, in an ideal world, our science is perfect. Um, we can determine an allocation, a catch allocation to the fleet that exactly matches the mix of fish out on the fishing grounds. However, because they have different optima and because they're in different states of rebuilding, their allocations don't match what's on the fishing grounds. So they run into a restriction with the lowest allocation relative to the availability, and that limits the attainment of multi-species yield. Um, this mismatch between the fish out on the fishing grounds and the allocation results from stock assessments that may be biased or uncertain, which they're always uncertain. Sometimes they're substantially biased. Um, they remain low while we're trying to rebuild some of the species and not others. And these accountability measures, these paybacks, for exceeding a bycatch limit actually makes the problem worse. Um, it may be that fishermen are having trouble avoiding a species because it's in a rebuilding plan, maybe because the stock assessment is biased low. Um, and if they exceed their annual catch limit, they need to catch even less the next year. And so we really get a, a feedback loop here that makes the problem worse and worse. And Looking back at our most recent um, performance report for New England groundfish, we see that we're, the fleet is only catching 32% of its allocation. Now, at one point this morning, I heard someone interpret this result as that there be, there's not enough fish out there for the fishermen to achieve their allocations anyway. Um, I think haddock shows how wrong that interpretation is. Our stock assessments of haddock uh, are that the stock is at a greater biomass than it's been since we started our sampling in the 1930s. Uh, the 2003 year class is the largest on record, or it was, until 2010. Now it appears that the 2010 is even much larger than the 2003 year class. So I, it's an uncertain assessment, but what is certain is there's a lot of haddock out there, but the fishermen can only catch 4 or 5% of them because of these choke stocks. So how can we confront this challenge of mixed stock fishery? Windowpane flounder is maybe an even more unreasonable case study. So windowpane is called this because you can see right through it, so it's not very marketable. Uh, it's basically a discard species uh, in these mixed stock fishery. Um, in our southern management unit, it's at greater than its minimum stock size threshold. Actually, that's greater than its BMSY proxy, so the stock is doing relatively well, but because the fishery caught more window pane uh, than they were allocated last year, uh, there's now accountability measures in the form of closed areas throughout the region. Um, these are estimated to cost the fishery about five, 10 million per year, uh, and that's in the ground fish fishery, in the scallop fishery, um, 
the cost of the closures hasn't been evaluated, but the total value of the scallop fishery is about 550 million a year. So we have very costly accountability measures for a stock that's not overfished, it's actually above its BMSY proxy, uh, simply because the bycatch was greater than the annual catch limit. So how can we confront these problems? Um, the first thing we can do is improve the science. We need more frequent stock assessments. We recognize that stock assessments are uncertain, but if we're going to wait three to four years between assessments, a lot can change in those three to four years. Um, we've seen, and I showed for Eastern Georgia's Bank Cod, that you have considerable changes in the resource, or even sometimes considerable changes in our perception of the resource. In-season monitoring is also something we can improve upon. We can allow fishermen to optimize their catch if they're given the information in time. And again, observer data in New England for some fisheries is not available until three months after the trips are taken. So going back to this simple schematic of cod haddock and yellowtail and what their optimal yield is as a function of fishing effort, what we really need to do is try to change the catchability. So now we've expanded this formula, rather than fishing mortality is catchability times fishing effort, we have the same effort. Um, it's a multi-species fishery that's affecting all of the species. There's actually 20 different ground fish stocks that's producing very different fishing mortalities in cod haddock and yellowtail because they have different catchabilities. So what we can try to do is to manage the catchabilities. And if we make fishing less efficient on yellowtail and cod, we can essentially move their yield curves so that the optimal yield for cod and yellowtail is similar to that of haddock. Hopefully, while retaining the efficiency of fishing on haddock, we can reduce the efficiency of fishing on yellowtail and cod. There's several ways to do this, and I'll show several examples. Uh, we can do gear research to make our fishing gear more selective to the, to the species that have higher allocations. Transferability has some expectations that it can um, confront some of these choke species problems. Uh, regulating the time and area uh, patterns of fishing to really avoid hot spots, and then really sharing information in a near real time to have active bycatch avoidance programs. So let's start with conservation engineering. Um, this has been an active field in fisheries for decades, uh, if not longer. Um, so we have things like haddock separator trawl um, to take advantage of the behavior of cod and haddock, where haddock tend to rise when confronted with mobile gear, and cod tend to stay on the bottom. So if there's an escape panel uh, below the separa separator panel, uh, the net will retain haddock while releasing cod. We also have flatfish escapement windows, so on the ground gear of trawls, we can have escapement windows that are below the net so that flatfish might uh, re be released and haddock may be retained. Transferability. Um, there are some expect expectations that are loosely based on cap and trade management of pollution. That if there is some transferability of catch allocations, that those allocations would be more valuable to a clean operator or that is an operator that can take advantage of the high allocations while avoiding the species that have low allocations. Um, so that transferability can help to achieve the allocations. This has been implemented, as many of you know much better than I. Uh, West Coast Groundfish um, Trawl Catch Share Program was instituted in 2011 through an individual fishing quota system where there is transferability. The shares are controlled by individual fishermen or cooperatives, and they're accountable for um, staying within their allocations. They've developed very creative solutions to some of these choke species problems. Um, yellowtail and canary rockfish are some of those that Anna showed that are rebuilding slowly. <coughs> so they have very low annual catch limits, but because of their aggregating nature, a single toe can uh, exceed the annual catch limit. So the creative solution here is that individuals pay into this risk pool with their species allocations, and it's really insurance for covering these accidental catches. 
Um, and then membership usually re requires selective fishing gear. So really trying to manage the catchability away from these recovering stocks. A catch share system was also implemented in New England uh, through a sector program. So these are essentially cooperatives of fishermen who get individual allocations. The individual allocations are pooled within sectors. Uh, so they're allocated this total allowable catch, uh, but they can lease from one sector or another to try to, for example, exploit haddock while avoiding cod. However, I already showed this table, transferability really has not solved the choke species problem in New England. That transferability has not uh, transferred allocation of haddock to the operators that can exploit haddock while avoiding yellowtail flounder and cod. One thing that has been promising is flexibility among fisheries. That although um, transferability within ground fish sectors hasn't um, achieved the catch allocations as expected, one thing that's been keeping the Northeast ground fish fishery afloat is catch from other fishery management plans. A third way of, of managing the catchability is recognizing that some species aggregate naturally. Uh, for cod, they form very dense spawning aggregations. So complementing the annual catch limits and allocations to sectors with um, spawning closures can reduce the catchability on cod. That was somewhat affected through these uh, relatively crude rolling closures uh, throughout the Gulf of Maine that are loosely based on where and when cod are spawning. Uh, and that has transitioned to more tailored and surgical uh, closures where we monitor uh, the arrival of cod aggregations, the density of cod aggregations, and the um, ending of the aggregation through acoustic tagging and hydroacoustic surveying. Bycatch avoidance uh, through data sharing um, has really been led in the, the Alaska region. Uh, here's an example uh, of avoiding halibut in the uh, yellowtail, uh, yellowfin sole fishery um, through near, nearly real-time uh, data sharing. Fishermen are available to avoid concentrations of halibut while targeting yellowfin sole. Uh, we took the spirit of that and applied that to uh, one of our more lucrative fisheries, scall uh, scallops, the Atlantic Sea Scallop Fishery, to avoid yellowtail flounder. Uh, there were a series of years where the, the fisheries for scallops were closed early because of their yellowtail bycatch, uh, resulting in fairly substantial losses in foregone yield over time. So we uh, tried to apply something similar to the Sea State program where fishermen were daily uh, emailing their catches in these Loran grids. Our school would then compile the information on a daily basis, transmit uh, an advisory back to the fleet daily so that they could avoid hot spots and target spots with, that had high scallop catch and low yellowtail flounder. <coughs> the first year that we implemented this, there was actually a bug in the email system so the first five days of the fishery, this is essentially still a derby fishery at this point. Um, the first five days of the fishery, our advisory was not reaching the fleet. Uh, after that fifth day, uh, the fleet did respond by moving away from some of the hot spots. And after five years of exceeding the bycatch quotas, in this year with bycatch avoidance, they only caught 32% of the yellowtail bycatch limit, but caught their entire scallop allocation worth about $40 million. In a review of different methods of monitoring our catchability, I uh, found that fleet communication really is one of the most effective for reducing the bycatch, having a minimum effect on the target catch, minimum effect on the non-target catch, uh, minimum effort impacts, and economic viability. Really, through this um, review, we found that applying multiple approaches is the most effective way of minimizing bycatch. And that has really been realized by the Morro Bay groundfish fishery, which again, many of you know better than I, um, in the context of reductions in the catch limits and economic losses, partnered with conservation groups to form these agreements, uh, where they do many of the things I just talked about. So they lease the catch to fishermen with restrictions on fishing gear. 
managing the catchability among species, uh, fishing areas, again, avoiding hotspots, fleet communication, electronic monitoring, all trying to engineer those species catchabilities to try to optimize um, the, op the yield of multi-species and try to attain the entire catch allocation. So I'll wrap this up with one slide of conclusions, really repeating some of the conditions I said earlier. That annual catch limits and accountability measures are expected to effectively avoid overfishing with some conditions that we do have catch estimation and stock estimates that are both accurate, timely, and transparent. So monitoring the catch in a way that the fishermen can use the information, stock assessments that can support um, reliable and appropriate annual catch limits, and stocks can be targeted individually. When we cannot target stocks individually, we need to try to engineer our species catchability through transferability, gear revisions, time area patterns, or bycatch avoidance, and recognizing that many of these can be voluntary rather than regulated. I have two recommendations. One's relatively simple. If you can't monitor the catch, you shouldn't expect annual catch limits to end overfishing. And for many of our industrial commercial fisheries, annual catch limits should be expected to end overfishing and rebuild stocks. But for many of our other fisheries, uh, we shouldn't expect annual catch limits to end overfishing. In fact, we probably should be advocating things like marine protected areas, size limits that are larger than the size at maturity, some fairly simple but robust management approaches that are expected to be more effective for ending overfishing than annual catch limits. The second recommendation is more complicated and it has to do with trying to remove this constraint of the choke stops. And part of that is in a single species approach to management is essentially managing each of them so each stock does not have a harvest late rate that's greater than the maximum sustainable yield harvest rate so that each stock rebuilds to the stock size associated with maximum sustainable yield. The act allows that optimum yield is managed by fisheries, not by stocks. And so implicitly, that does support the National Standard 1 guidelines for a mixed stock exemption. And it basically what the mixed stock exemption says is that you can deliberately overfish some stocks in a mixed fishery to achieve the net benefit to the nation. However, that exemption has never been applied. It's never been applied because this mandate is fairly vague. What I would re recommend is that this mandate be specified so that we should avoid endangering all the stocks, but that we might, that the optimum yield for the fishery might involve maintaining, maintaining some stocks at less than their MSY level and fishing some stocks at, at greater than their harvest rate associated with maximum sustainable yield, recognizing that there's a range of harvest rates above FMSY that are still quite sustainable. With that, I'll thank the organizers again and look forward to talking more with all of you.